according to the cloud and good to go. Enough of time wasted. So tonight's lab is on molar mass and stoichiometry. It is lab number eight from the lab manual. It's going to cover things like the stoichiometric equation, empirical formula. Uh, this also brings us back to the difference between the empirical formula, the molecular formula. Uh, technically, what we call the formula unit and why there are different terms for this. The formula weight. versus the molecular weight. Essentially the same thing, but there's a reason why there are different terms. This also brings us to the important concept of a new unit that, a unit of measure that if you guys have never seen it before, the mole, that's important to cover. And of course, Avogadro, we should actually give it a capital A because it's named after a person. Avogadro, Avogadro, number. A whole bunch of other topics that go with this, but that is at least some of the core concepts that are necessary for this lab. As an aside, hopefully you guys are getting more comfortable with balancing equations. Chapter five material would be balancing equations and everything associated with chemical equations and chemical reactions. Those are very important. Uh, of course, those tie directly into this lab as well. So let's see if we can make this a succinct but accessible monologue, actually dialogue, hopefully. So to start with, uh, let's look at something like, since this is part of chapter six, I'm actually going to have chapter six open in front of me. There we are. Okay, so we have talked about, to begin with, I believe it was in chapter two, we talked about atomic weight, which would be the mass of individual atoms in atomic mass units, AMU. Okay. And that's drawing from chapter two. And you can utilize those values to get a molecular weight, which would be uh, covalently bonded atoms forming molecules, of course. So remember, molecules are formed from atoms that form uh, covalent bonds. That gives you molecules. So then you can calculate in AMU, the mass of individual molecules. And that should make sense. You just use the numbers that are associated with each element. So if you think about that, you guys okay if I move to the next slide, progress, et cetera? Okay. So an example of this would be something like, let's just look at a brief example, CO2. Come on. Aye, aye, aye. So an example of this, uh, therefore, would be carbon is about 12. And I don't actually mind you guys if you do round. Uh, if we are a little more accurate, you can use 12.01. AMU for carbon. Uh, oxygen actually usually is 16. And I think, what does it say up there? 15.99 something? For oxygen, the atomic mass. OK, so we can use 2 times 15.994. 
And if we just kind of go with that being very close to 16 and this being close to 12, then we could approximate this to, let's see, that's 32 plus 12 is 44. So approximately 44 AMU is the molecular weight of CO2. Okay. This makes sense so far. Okay. I hope I'm not going too fast. This should be relatively straightforward. Um, then you have the formula unit, which is the symbolic representation of ionic compounds. And remember, we, use the, we, we call this the formula unit because unlike molecular compounds, um, unlike molecular compounds, these are ionic bonds. And so therefore, there is nothing that says there is a discrete size of a ionic compound. Ionic compounds can have an indefinite size. They can get as big as there are ions around to form a pure uh, piece of that ionic compound. So the, the formula unit is a uh, most reduced ratio producing a um, formula with zero total charge, OK? And that's because there's no point in trying to look at a larger size that uh, because you would go on forever. You literally would be approaching infinity before you said, okay, let's stop. And these pieces would not be of a size that you would be able to go, okay, that is sodium chloride. And now that is not sodium chloride, for example. If you look at something like sodium chloride, you have, I, I think I've said this before, you can have little tiny crystals that you cook with, you know, so table salt, little tiny crystals of sodium chloride. You can have huge blocks of rock salt that are still sodium chloride that you use for uh, treating snow on the road. And you can even have just huge pieces of that sodium chloride that they would have actually crushed to make even those ex more accessible pieces that you use for treating the road. The sodium chloride doesn't have a discrete size that we actually can call. This is a piece of sodium chloride. That makes sense? And there never occurs actually a piece of sodium chloride that is just one sodium ion and one chloride ion together. You won't find that in nature. It's really not possible. Um, that makes sense so far? OK. So if that makes sense, then the formula weight is just like the molecular weight. It's the same concept, OK? You just calculated, calculate it for formula units. And it's almost obnoxious with how redundant and also how many different names scientists come up with for the same thing. Uh, the way I look at it is people come up with nicknames for, the, for each other and an infinite number of insults as well. So there's many, many different things that people call each other. Scientists end up doing the same thing. Except we usually don't try to insult molecules because there's no reason to. Good so far? OK. Now, so that takes us back to this set we talked about the empirical form well we haven't talked about the empirical formula yet we've talked about the formula weight and the general idea of a molecular weight okay now for molecules there's actually two types of formulas, okay? The empirical formula and the molecular formula. The one that we've talked about before, one that we've talked about before is the molecular formula. This is the actual symbolic 
representation of the molecule, giving the accurate number of atoms of each element within the molecule. So that's what you'd expect. It's the symbolic representation of the molecule. Straightforward. Okay. Now the problem is that, well, there's a number of problems. But one of the problems is historically, some of the scientific techniques that we have used for trying to figure out the composition of molecules doesn't actually give us initially the full molecular formula. It actually yields a ratio, a lowest common ratio of elements, just like you would a formula unit, okay? You essentially get a formula unit of a molecule. Now that is a problem because the same ratio can actually apply to a bunch of different molecules that are multiples of that ratio, and they are different molecules, okay? So, I'll, I, I'm repeating that a couple of times because it's a, it's a little bit wordy and it's a it's a slightly different difficult concept if you've never encountered it before. So I'm going to say molecules can be built in different multiples of the same ratio of elements. That's another way to think about what I'm saying. So molecules can be built in different multiples of the same ratio of elements. Does that make sense? OK. Um, did I talk to you guys about carbohydrates? Does that ring a bell? I don't didn't think I did, but I just wanted to check. I think. That was the conversation I had on Tuesday, but that's a difficult thing to recall always. So an example of this, and let me give you a few examples of these, what I'm talking about. Okay, so a most reduced ratio could be CH2O. Now, there is a molecule, CH2O. There actually is a very straightforward molecule that is built of CH2O, okay? So if we look at the first iteration of that, you can have something that looks like this. Here's a Lewis structure for you, which is the actual structure, not just a formula, but a structure, okay? And of course, if I'm gonna do a Lewis structure, it needs to have lone pairs on the oxygen, okay? So that is a molecule where everything is satisfied. All of the octet uh, rules are satisfied. Oxygen has an octet there. Carbon has an octet, and each hydrogen has the pair of electrons it needs in its own shell. This is a stable structure. This compound uh, you may have heard of. This is called formaldehyde. Very simple compound, quite toxic, used as a preservative. A lot of the things that are used as preservatives are highly toxic. The whole point of a preservative is to prevent something from growing. So you want substances that are extremely toxic when you create preservatives, at least not food preservatives, of course, but preservatives that you use for things like preserving samples uh, of animals that you've collected. If you collect a butterfly or something, you put it in a jar, filling with formaldehyde, fantastic idea because nothing will grow in there. Zombie butterflies definitely won't occur. No worries. Good. Good so far? Okay. Now, by that same token, you can actually have, so this is CH2O, but that doesn't mean this is the only substance that can exist like this. You can have C2H4O2. This substance does exist. You can have C5H10O2 maintaining that ratio, okay? And all iterations of this exist, C3, 
H6O2, C4, H6, uh, H8, sorry, to maintain the ratio, H8, O4, C6, H12, O6. Now, there are a name for this class of molecule. I mentioned it before. This is the general formula for a carbohydrate. Okay. And it, the name kind of makes sense if you look at it. It's carbohydrate carbon water. Okay. Each carbon in a carbohydrate literally has the atoms of a water molecule on it. Every single atom in a carbohydrate has the atoms of a water molecule attached to it, hence the name carbohydrate. All right, good so far? Okay, in fact, this would be called a pentose, and this would be called a hexose, which are terms for types of sugars. Question, this is not. But this, this de level of detail is not on the test. But what I'm trying to do is provide examples, OK? The sort of thing that could be on the test is to begin with the idea of what the empirical formula is and the difference between the empirical formula and the molecular formula, OK? So to point out explicitly, this right here, this is the empirical formula. And what is the empirical formula? It is the most reduced ratio of elements within a molecule. Therefore, doesn't necessarily represent the molecular formula. The molecular formula can be a multiple of the empirical formula. Now, if you're formaldehyde, you are both the empirical formula and the molecular formula, because this thing here is is CH2O, and there's no argument about that. It is the multiple of one of that empirical formula. You get it by multiplying by one, right? You can see the rest of these that I've written here are molecular formulas that are multiples of two, or three, or four, or five, or six, OK? And that is the discrete difference between a molecular formula and an empirical formula is that a molecular formula can be, it, well, the molecular formula provides the precise number of atoms of each element, whereas the empirical formula is the most reduced ratio. Okay. Any questions about that difference? Uh, Pentos, uh, this is the same thing multiplied by five carbon times five, so five. Hydrogen, 5 times 2 is 10. And then oxygen, oh, this should be a 5. My apologies, you're right. Thank you. I was wondering, for, I, I meant to write a 5. It was a reversed 5. Yeah, it was a, it was a mirrored 5, yeah. Uh, see, I knew I was going to make at least one mistake tonight. That was, hopefully, that will be my one mistake of the night. Does it make sense now? OK, cool. Uh, C3, oh, wow. OK. Yeah, C3H6O3. Uh, and then you can see that this one is an eight. Yeah. So the whole idea is that the ratio is maintained. The one to two to one ratio in, in, the, in regard to the carbohydrates is maintained. Exactly. Yeah. And if it isn't maintained, then there's definitely an error. So thank you for catching those and pointing them out. Okay. Have some confidence in yourself, guys. Question. No, they are not. And I'm very glad you asked that question. So formaldehyde is not the same thing as uh, C5H10O5. And for one of the reasons for that is, have you ever heard of 
ribose. Okay, ribose is the sugar present in RNA. Uh, RNA, the name RNA stands for rib. Uh, I sorry, it's ribulose. No, no, it's ribose. It's ribose. Uh, oh my God, RNA stands for ribose uh, nucleic acid, ribo ribonucleic acid, and the ribo part is the ribose, which is the sugar found in RNA. I don't want to spend any time lecturing on that. I'm going to avoid that. But the point I'm trying to make is um, ribose is a very different substance from formaldehyde. Uh, it has a very different structure. Uh, the structure of this thing to begin with is carbon, carbon. It's a five carbon chain. And then each one has attached to it an oxygen and uh, two hydrogens. Question. Um, that sort of thing. It, yeah, I could ask you, is C5H10O5 a molecular formula or empirical formula? And then the next one would be something like, um, for example, if you have C2H4, so this thing can be this thing. But you could actually make something that is um, so that the the this is a molecular formula. That makes sense. It's not the most reduced ratio. This would actually be C H two would be the empirical formula, and this is the molecular formula. Okay. This is an, almost a better example because here, this, this, this empirical formula cannot exist. This, you can't make a molecule of CH2. That doesn't exist. Carbon needs at least four hydrogens attached to it. If you're going to stick all hydrogens on there, you need another two hydrogens to satisfy the octet rule of that carbon. Okay. Question. It, well, yes, it is the empirical formula of the C2H4. Certain chemical techniques. Okay, so here's the here's the primary reason the empirical formula exists is because certain scientific techniques that you would use to figure out the chemical composition of things only yield the empirical formula. Okay, so to begin with, you start out and you get the empirical formula provided to you, or you will do the experiment that provide the empirical formula to you. Okay, We wouldn't need to worry about the empirical formula if all of our scientific techniques yielded every time the molecular formula. But certain approaches to determining chemical composition that are very quick and very cheap only give you the ratio of elements. And because they only give you the ratio, they give you literally that reduced ratio. Um, there's something called combustion analysis, which is a very relatively old technique and is exactly what it sounds like. You burn whatever you're interested in determining the chemical composition of, and it only yields the most reduced ratio. There are other techniques you can use for figuring out more information, but to begin with, you would only get the most reduced ratio there. Does that make sense? OK. So combustion analysis, very cheap, because burning stuff is pretty cheap to do compared to some options, uh, yields your empirical formula. Now, that empirical formula does not guarantee that it is the mole molecule that you're looking at. Because if you get the ratio of CH2, we go, OK, that's not a real molecule. You think you might have made a mistake. Right, might even go, oh shoot, I don't know what's going on. My technique doesn't work. But the technique does work. It's just giving you the ratio of the elements. And once you know the ratio of the elements, you can apply other information to actually figure out the molecular formula. 
that makes sense? Okay, awesome. Um, it does actually get easier, especially once you know how to utilize moles. Sometimes if you have a pure sample and you're able to burn the entire sample, you can actually utilize that information to get further data from your combustion analysis and actually back calculate the molecular formula based upon the total mass as well. I don't want to spend a lot of time doing that right now, but when it comes to that, we can talk about that. Does that make sense so far? Okay. Now, your question about whether or not formaldehyde, these are all formaldehyde, is still a good question. Let me point out another example. This right here, hexosis, is a very common collective term. There's actually no compound called a hexose, specifically. It's a group of terms. The, a group of, uh, it's a collective definition of a whole group of things. It's like saying this is a, uh, an animal. There are lots of different types of animals, right? There are lots of different types of hexoses. Hexose just means six carbon sugar. So if you take a nutrition class or a biology class or a biochemistry class, you'll encounter the term hexose, meaning carbon, uh, six carbon sugar. And there's a whole bunch of them. You're familiar with some of these names. Glucose is a hexose. Fructose is also a hexose. They are just rearrangements of those atoms. They contain the same exact molecular formula. Their structures are different, but they contain the same exact molecular formula. Okay. Now, am I losing you guys? Okay, good. Glucose and fructose, because their structures are different, in the arrangement of the atoms have slightly different chemical properties, but they do have exactly the same ratio and exactly the same uh, number of atoms. They have six carbons, 12 hydrogen, and six oxygens, okay, both fructose and glucose. I don't want to go down this rabbit hole much further, but I do want to move, I do want to make sure that, that I convey this, okay? The not only the uh, chemical composition, but the arrangement of those atoms is vital in determining what a molecule is when it comes to a molecule. Okay. This is why molecules are so much more interesting in general than ionic compounds. Ionic compounds only get interesting when you start talking about crystalline structures, generally. Okay. The arrangement can vary with crystal. Again, not vital information. Don't want to spend time on it. Want to keep you keep focused and maintain. Here is what you need to know. Okay. So, are you doing okay with the empirical formula versus the molecular formula? All right. Um, so, again, here are the things we're looking at. Okay. We've talked about the formula unit. We talked about molecular weight, the formula weight, the molecular formula, the empirical formula. Good so far. Okay. Now, let's talk about the mole. And before I even do that, take a deep breath, clear your mind, have a minute where I'm not talking. Quiet is good. A bit of a, for lack of a better term, mental palate cleanser. Okay. Now, the next thing is the mole. Okay. We've talked about a number of things. The first thing to consider is The mass of every element is different, okay? For example, hydrogen has a mass 
of 1.008 AMU. Okay. Carbon has a mass of 12.01 AMU. And one last example, uh, let's use chlorine. Because it's significantly different. Has a mass of 35.45 AMU. Okay. That means that the mass of each of, of these three different particles is significantly different. Does that make sense so far? Okay. Now, if that makes sense so far, ask yourself this question. What happens when I measure out one gram of each pure element? Specifically, ask yourself this. Will each of these grams have the same number of atoms? Okay. Take a moment. Think about that. Just, just take a moment. Contemplate. Good so far? OK. I don't want to make this more complicated, but I do also want to tell you all the information available to you. OK. okay. As an aside, has anyone ever heard of, I don't want to put that there, has anyone ever heard of a unit called the Dalton? Has anyone ever heard of a unit called the Dalton. You heard of that? Awesome. That's OK. Then I'm going to refresh you, your memory. One Dalton is the same thing as one AMU. OK? One Dalton is, is just another name for an atomic mass. AMU feels a little less tangible than if we call it a Dalton for some reason. I think people get up on get stuck on how long the name is, atomic mass unit. It's a very long name for a unit. If I say Dalton, people go, ah, yes, of course, the Dalton. Just like saying gram. If I go gram, Dalton, so on and so forth. But if I say atomic mass unit, people start going too many words. So we're just going to say one AMU, the same thing as one Dalton. OK. The reason I mention this is Dalton's do occur out in the world. So if someone tells you we're talking about Dalton's, they're actually just talking about atomic mass units. OK. So one AMU equals one Dalton. It's the only reason I mention this. So you can completely ignore the Dalton now from now on if you want to. One AMU is equal to. One point six six one times ten to the minus twenty four grams. Now, I don't usually teach this because this is a conversion that's really not necessary. You don't actually have to be able to use this conversion. Okay, this piece of information is actually not essential to your success in chemistry. But what I do want you to tie it tie in here is atomic mass units are not an intangible unit. They have a direct correlation to mass units that you're familiar with. They are just a way of handling an incredibly small mass. Okay, One atomic mass unit 
is just simply a way of dealing with the fact that a single atom has a very, very tiny mass. Keep in mind, hydrogen is essentially one AMU, right? If hydrogen is essentially one AMU, then a hydrogen atom has approximately the mass of 1.661 times 10 to the minus 24 gram. So saying one AMU is typically easier, okay? What the only reason I'm showing you this is to, to point out you are used to grams, right? Anytime I say AMU, it is equivalent to saying grams, okay? They're not equal equals, but there's a direct correlation, a direct conversion, okay? So therefore, when I ask you this question, will each of these one gram of atoms contain the same number of particles? What's the answer? Will one gram of chlorine contain the same number of atoms as one gram of hydrogen, for example? Okay. The answer is no, because the masses are significantly different. These particles are of a very different size. So if I am holding one gram of chlorine, that is going to be a significantly different number of particles than one gram of hydrogen. Now, to be able to calculate this and prove it to you, we have to talk about couple of other things first. So these things I'm about to introduce you to are so that we can actually discuss particles in a graspable way, an easier way of doing it. Okay. There are easier ways of doing these things. So what is a mole? Long story short. There was a gentleman with the surname Avogadro, and I can't remember the rest of his name. He was some sort of count, I believe, in Italy. I could be wrong. But he was a wealthy nobleman. A wealthy noble person in general is what you would have to be prior to the 20th century to be able to engage in scientific research. You'd have to have the money to be able to take it up as a hobby. So there you go. Avogadro, however, said... Let's come up with a unit that we use to count large numbers of things. He said, let's call it the mole. He proposed that because he was trying to count molecules. The mole, however, is just a way of counting a large number of things. One mole is equal to 6.02 technically it goes on and on and on, but 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd things of whatever we're talking about that mole. So one mole of things is equal to 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd things. One mole of things contains 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd things. So there is an official term, Avogadro's number. It's named after him because he was the one who came up with the idea. And it is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd things per one mole of things. You could calculate the number of moles of people on the planet if you wanted to. Okay. What is it? Seven billion? We might be approaching eight billion now. I've lost track. It got depressing and I stopped paying attention. Too many people. Where can I go to hide? Question. 
probably is running out of battery. Absolutely right. Thank you for checking. With my luck, it's already shut off. Resuming recording. Thank you for pointing that out. All right, so hopefully this is now recording. And let's check one last time. That's working, check one, check two. That's working, good. Yeah, okay. Now I recorded myself testing the system. Really. Okay, you guys gonna enjoy that for later amusement. Out after you've sat through half an hour or an hour of silence. So, Avogadro's number, okay? 6.02 uh, times 10 to the 23rd is things per one mole of things. Make sense so far? Okay. Now, we can tie this together with the fact that if you take the molecular weight or formula weight, and consider the fact that 12 grams of pure carbon 12 contains 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms carbon. So, Molecular weight, formula weight, that's or atomic weight, whatever you want to think about these things. Okay, these are all we've seen how the atomic weight, the molecular weight, the formula weight, they are all just extensions of each other, taking the mass of each element and utilizing that to figure out what the molecule then has a mass of, or the formula, the ionic compound has a general mass of in AMU. Make sense so far? Okay. Someone had the bright idea and said. What happens if, if we take 12.01 grams of pure carbon and count the number of particles? Well, that contains approximately 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of carbon. Okay. Which means if 12.01 grams of carbon 12 contain 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of carbon, then one mole of carbon 12 has a mass of 12.01 grams. Okay. Remember that one mole contains 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd things. That's one mole of things contains 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd of those things. So therefore, if 12.01 grams of carbon contain 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of carbon. One mole of carbon has a mass of 12.01 grams. Does that make sense? I see the connection. Okay. It, the connection is 12.01 grams of this thing, carbon 12, contains 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of carbon. And one mole of carbon atoms must contain 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd carbon atoms. So therefore, the molar mass of carbon 12 is equal to 12.01 grams of carbon per mole of carbon. And 
now. That was what I was trying to go for, is hopefully not too complicatedly, but tying together, getting to this thing called the molar mass. You need to be able to convert grams to moles and moles to grams. The mole is just a nice way of counting atoms and not having to say 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd carbon atoms all the time. Or if it was a half a mole, uh, 3.01 times 10 to the 23rd uh, carbon atoms. And things can get much smaller and much larger than that quite fast. Using the mole is a very simplified way of keeping track of particles. The whole point of the mole is to count stuff in large quantities. Just like saying a dozen eggs is faster than saying, feels faster than saying 12 eggs. Okay. Five dozen eggs is easier than saying 60 eggs, theoretically. Does that make sense? The concept of a dozen contains 12 things. One mole made 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd thing. So the molar mass allows us to convert between moles and grams. Because the molar mass is simply the atomic or molecular uh, or formula unit weight or formula weight. in grams per mole, which is also written grams per mole like that. Okay. Doing all right, guys? Okay. How are we doing on time? A little bit slower than I wanted, but that's okay. So, a couple of examples. Ready? Okay. One gram of chlorine atoms to moles to number of chlorine atoms. First, one gram of chlorine multiplied by one mole of chlorine over 35.45 grams of chlorine. Plug that into your calculator, which I have somewhere. Yeah, whatever. So what do we get when we do that? Well, it's literally just one. In this case, it's one divided by 35.45. And we get something on the order of 2.82 times 10 to minus 2 moles fluorine at Make sense so far? Straightforward? Keep in mind that this is the molar mass of chlorine, and that is just coming from the atomic mass of chlorine. Literally, is just the atomic mass with new units stuck on it. It's like taking a really bad uh, Ford Escort removing the engine and the tires, et cetera, slapping on something that, you know, foreign with much better power and suddenly going dragging racing in it. Okay. 
now have taken the atomic weight, the formula weight, the molecular weight, and are making use of it in a way that actually can be utilized to calculate stuff. So then, of course, if we've got 2.82 times 10 to the minus 2 moles of chlorine atoms, we can then use 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd chlorine atoms per one mole of chlorine. Plug that in. And just multiply it by 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. And you'll get 1.6. At 1.7 actually, but we'll, we'll just 6, 9, 8 times 10 to the 22, of course, 22nd atoms of chlorine. Good so far. Okay. That's okay if I move forward. All right. A couple of other examples here. If you have five moles of C6H12O6, one of my favorite molecules. It is very sweet tasting. It is a great substance, good source of energy. Carbs are not evil. It's just overindulgence that will get you into trouble. So five moles of C6H12O6 contain how many moles of each element? Because this can be a question you will be looking at. In five moles of glucose, how many moles of carbon are there? Now, for this one, you don't actually need a periodic table. How would you do it? What's the ratio of carbon mole, of moles of carbon to moles of glucose? It is right in front of you. Hmm? I think I heard it. It's six to one. Exactly. Have confidence in yourself. It is. It, it, this can be that accessible. Absolutely. Believe in yourself. Okay. It is literally one mole of C6H12O6 to six moles of carbon. 30 moles of carbon. One mole of glucose contains six moles of carbon, 12, carbon, 12 moles of hydrogen, and six moles of of oxygen. So five moles of glucose contain 30 moles of carbon, 60 moles of hydrogen, and 30 moles of oxygen. And it can be that straightforward. If this makes sense, awesome. Because stoichiometry is one of those things that should be highly accessible to you. It should be. Okay. This goes back to chapter one. Really what we're going to be doing with this is really just unit conversions and just recognizing ratios. This is just unit conversions, recognizing ratios, and knowing how to pull the conversion factors you need to get where you're going. Okay. This is a lot easier or should be easier than quantum mechanics, which technically requires calculus to understand. And even then, the quantum mechanics that we discussed in this course was a lot of memorization with weird rule. This stuff is accessible, I hope. It's easier to, to understand how many eggs in a dozen eggs, right? If you open up the lid, you count 12, right? So if someone asked you, if I gave you 12 eggs, how many dozen of eggs do you have? Your instinct is just one. Same thing here. If I hand you one mole of glucose, it contains six atom, six moles of carbon. Same thing. All you're doing is opening it up or repackaging. Okay. 
How are we doing? I'm concerned, confused. Okay, now. Uh, Stoichiometric equation, what they're talking about there is simply the balanced chemical equation. Okay. The coefficients of a balanced chemical equation tell you the ratio of particles of reactants that yield your ratio of particles of product. So in a balanced chemical equation, you know how many of one particles of one reactant you need to combine with another reactant, presuming there's two reactants, to produce one or three or however many products you have. And they will be produced in the ratio told to you by the coefficient. So therefore, if you know how many moles of a reactant, you can actually predict how many moles of the other reactant you need, because this is a ratio of particles. Moles are nothing but a way of counting particles. Moles count particles. Coefficients tell you information about particles. So we have an equation like, DH4 plus O2 gas, gas. So this is a combustion reaction of carbon tetrahydride with diatomic oxygen, and it'll produce carbon dioxide and water. Now, this is not a balanced equation, and that should be clear to you. We've got three, two, three oxygens on one side, two oxygens on the other, four hydrogens there, two hydrogens there. What do we need to do? What well, we need to put two here. That now gives us four hydrogens and four oxygens. So I'm going to come along and put a two here. This is not a difficult equation to balance but I did that for the brevity of time. What does this tell us? For every one mole or molecule, but for every particle or mole of CH4, we need two moles of O2. And it tells us we produce one mole of CO2 and two moles of H2O. And you can create sentences like this for every single molecular formula up there. For every two moles of oxygen, you need one mole of methane. For every two moles of oxygen, you produce one mole of carbon dioxide. And this just starts creating conversion factors. So one mole of CH4 to two moles of O2. One mole of CH4 to one mole of CO2. One mole of CH four to two moles of H2O, okay? These are flippable. 
depending on which direction you want to use them for a conversion. If I had seven moles of methane, how many moles of oxygen do I need to completely consume all of that methane? Pardon? Exactly. How did we do that? Does anyone need more time? So, How many moles of O2 needed to use seven moles of carbon tetrahydride? Seven moles of CH4, one mole of CH4, to two moles of O2, the conversion factor that came from the coefficients of the balanced equation, the ratio of the coefficients it comes from the balanced equations. See, methane, methane cancels, and we get 14 moles of O2. You could ask, how many moles of carbon dioxide will be produced from, seven, from completely combusting seven moles of carbon tetrahydride? It would be if it was so this question, how much CO2 produced from complete combustion of seven moles of carbon tetrahedride? seven moles of carbon tetrahydride over one times one mole of CO2 is the ratio to one mole of carbon tetrahydride. The amount of product produced, therefore, would be seven moles of CO2. Now, the only other thing that we would do here that might be fancier is if someone said from 25 grams of carbon tetrahydride, what mass of water could be produced? That's the only thing fancier. Let's go there in a second. Are you guys okay with me so far? Does this make sense how to utilize the coefficient? Then all, all we've here done is said the coefficients allow, so coefficients of your balanced equation give the mole to mole ratio of our products and reactants and to each other. for conversion between moles of, if it's product to product or product to reactant, et cetera. You can do reactant to reactant, reactant to product, product to reactant, the ratio is what allows you to convert mole to mole of different number of particles. Okay. Make sense so far? You guys okay with this? There's all sorts of analogies I could give you, but I don't want to do that unless it's absolutely necessary. If this is making sense. I don't want to waste your time with abstractions. Now, we measure things in the lab in mass 
units of grams for convenience. There's no balance that measures moles. And counting particles is out of question. I'm not going to ask anyone to sit here and count 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd of anything, or even 1 times 10 to the minus 23rd of something. That's still too few things. The point being, mass is a very convenient, tangible unit in grams to just go over to a balance and weigh out. Okay. But we've already seen that grams of one element or molecule essentially cannot be equal to grams of another element or molecule, et cetera, et cetera. Like I said, one mole of hydrogen atoms is not equal to one mole of chlorine atoms. Uh, sorry, one gram of chlorine atoms does not contain the same number of particles as one gram of hydrogen, okay? Et cetera, et cetera. We've had that conversation. So therefore, what you must do is go from grams of, for example, in our previous equation, CH4, if you were given grams of CH4, you must first find moles of CH4. This is done using the molar mass of CH4. Then from that, if we were looking for, say, how much CO2, like we said on the last one, but in grams, you would need to get moles of CO2 utilizing the mole mole ratio of coefficients from your balanced equation, moles of one thing to moles of the other. And then you can use the molar mass of CO2 to get grams of CO2. Put this all together. This is, now could I have shown you this map first and then tried to explain it? I'm not certain. I'm not certain it would have clicked into place. There are different ways of exploring this and I could have said, well, this is what we're trying to achieve. This is the goal. This is what we're trying to do. Go grams to moles to moles to grams, okay? And you can do that in one calculation if you want to. All you have to do is lay out the correct number, a correct conversion factor. Okay. Now, are there any questions here? You guys with me so far? Okay. Let's see. Uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera, stuff. Okay. Now, if this is making sense, let's talk less course material and more tonight, what you're going to do, and this lab more specifically, okay? This lab contains two parts. It contains a whole bunch of explanation, and then you get to the actual experiment on page 88. Okay. Good so far. Okay. Now, I'll show you how, first of all, what we are doing tonight. So this lab, this is lab eight. There are two parts, okay? They're gonna contain the same basic idea. The basic idea is you take the stuff that we're gonna do experiment on, you put it in a crucible, put stuff in crucible, okay? Now, you're gonna wanna do weight by difference. What you're gonna wanna do therefore, of course, remember is get the weight of the empty crucible and lid, put the stuff inside, 
and then the total weight of crucible and lid and stuff. Now, why am I saying stuff? I'm saying stuff because we're going to do this, these experiments today and then a week from today on two different substances. Okay. Once you've done, once you've got the stuff with the weight inside, then you're going to set up a rickety old lab pole. It's going to slot into those holes on the bench. It's going to have a little ring that you're then going to drop this uh, thing that literally is a clay triangle and is called a clay triangle on there. So your crucible will sit there on the clay triangle. And the clay triangle will be directly above a Bunsen burner, which looks something like this and plugs into gas, of course. And we're going to get a flame going. And you'll want a blue flame with an inner cone. It looks something like that. Blue, tight flame with kind of a translucent figure flame around it. And then the protocol here is going to be spelled out in detail. Okay. So for example, on page 89, talking about the first substance that we're going to do, you are going to take, so part B is this week, is going to be combustion of magnesium. Try not to stare directly at the magnesium. It burns very, very brightly. It will hurt your eyes if you are not careful. You're going to do that. There shouldn't be, you should not get it to combust. Okay, what you should do, theoretically, we just want to see our sparks and maybe we want to see it turn, how to describe it, until it's turned a grayish white solid. Looking for a grayish question? Okay. So you're looking for a grayish white solid. Let it cool for 10 minutes, like they say. Then you're going to add H2O. I'll show you where the, where the D, what we call DH2O, which is the deionized. Water. The DH2O is what you want to use. You want to use deionized water here. The reason you want to use deionized water is because you're going to get the water to react with this now uh, burned magnesium. It's been activated by burning it. You're going to put water in there. And that's actually going to cause a chemical reaction. You're going to go magnesium plus H2O. This is the burned one. And that, that has activated it. And I think the first thing we're going to do is here you should get remember correctly, you should actually be making magnesium hydroxide, theoretically. Then you take this stuff and you heat it again. That's where we are. Cover the crucible with the lid and begin heating for another 10 minutes. So you heat it for 10 minutes. And what you're actually then going to produce is magnesium oxide. And, and I'm not even giving anything away because it literally says what these substances are. I'm not giving any secrets away here. Okay, they've already told you that you will produce magnesium oxide. Um, so then you will then, then uh, allow it to cool. Ten minutes and then get the weight of your crucible plus lid plus stuff that's inside there. Okay. And then you'll do mass by difference to get the mass of just the stuff. 
and then you'll be able to start doing calculations. With it. Okay, that's part B. Part C, uh, a week from today, will be the decomposition of sodium hydrogen carbonate, also known as baking powder. Not baking powder. Uh, baking soda. Baking powder and baking soda are different things. This is baking soda. Um, so that one we will do next week. Don't worry about that one too much right now. Okay. This, therefore, this means today, part B on three. 17, so 3, 23, 22, part C, and then on 3, 30, 22, should be the Thursday, these should be the Thursdays, and if they aren't, then I apologize in advance on my miscalculation. So on the 30th of March is when this lab is due the hard copy in lab. No electronic submissions will be available for this lab. And going forward, no more electronic submissions for lab. For assignments in, in the lab portion of this class, I just want you guys to try them into me physically. Okay. I'll grade them faster. There'll be less problems with the electronic submission. We'll avoid all that problem. You guys will get it turned in on time. We're just going to go back to, since you're here in person, turn it in in person. Okay. Good so far? Okay. Any questions? All right. Now, therefore, the first thing, the, the last thing I think I will say is, um, if you per turn to page 91, it says setting up the crucible for data there. What I am actually going to say is just go ahead and um, instead of writing sentences, feel free to use that as a data collection area. And then part B below, use that as where you finally record the data. Okay. Part A, I want you to consider as available to you for scratch notes of part B and part C. And then parts B and C, you can record your data and your calculations in a very clean, easy fashion. Make sense? And if you don't want to use part A, that's okay too. You, you can record your data how you like to. I'm just saying part A is not something that I'm going to utilize in its intended form, even if that gets me into trouble. This has been my last semester. It's been great. Uh, Got to have some, right? So. Any questions so far? Okay, and I'm going to stop this recording before I make, make even more trouble.